Hi folks, task at hand today, machine this cast pattern out of Renboard. When I first saw this job, it's for a 1943, I believe, South Bend lathe retrofit. Link in the video description to the Instagram fellow who's posting some content on doing it. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So we marked the edges of the raw material uh, with some Sharpie on the Pearson vacuum plate. Obviously I want to maximize the work down holding area. This is a pretty large surface area. They're one inch square so you can do the math, but it's well over a few thousand pounds of hold down force, which is awesome. Pearson system I like as well. Shows you when you've got a positive vacuum with that uh, red button going down. Vacuum hold down force is sort of in the Z axis. But when you've got this much, you've also got phenomenal radial stability. So I'm pushing on this with basically all my might. And with the Mitsutoyu half thousands indicator, we're getting really, it's measurable right now, but it's insignificant, less than a thousandth of an inch. Coordinate system is right in the center of our part. We've got a fair amount of excess stock on the left and right side, not too much in Y though. And we're machining up one, leaving a fair amount of stock along the bottom. We'll flip that and go to work finishing up the rest of it. I swept across the top of it just to check and see how flat it was. Ends up that doesn't matter. These were two pieces of uh, ren board or, or knockoff ren board that were glued together to get the additional thickness. Copy our cam file into PathPilot. And one of the things I really like about PathPilot is the visual interface. This is really, really nice. Here we're looking at a top-down view, but I can right-click, switch to a front view, and it gives me a really good idea of what's going on. I can jog around. You can even do this while the machine is running. That's one of the things, <laughs> remember Mach 3? That's what PathPilot does a really better job of, is able to triage what's important and control the machine with first priority, giving you sort of second priority to still handle some graphics stuff. Recipe is a adaptive with a long tool. It's a 3 8 inch diameter tool with a two and a half inch flute length and a three inch shoulder length. So the rule of thumb on stick out has to do with how long the tool is relative to diameter. So three inches long divided by 0.375 means we're at eight times diameter. That's long, three or four times diameter, usually okay. This is pretty crazy. Luckily, Ren board isn't too difficult to machine, so I think we'll be okay. By the way, normally in my tool library, I don't worry too much in Fusion about setting the flute length and the shoulder length and the body length. Here, it is really helpful because we need to make sure as we're machining this part away, we've got sufficient flute length and collet clearance as we walk all the way around this part. Pause just to remove the indicator from the front. I wanted to see if the indicator moved when we started that cut. Uh, it did not. We're running that 3 8 inch tool at max RPM, 7 thou per tooth. That's 107 inches a minute. Even crazier, 0.3 inch optimal load. So that's 80% step over. That's a lot. We're stepping down with a maximum roughing step down of one inch. So this is a one inch by 0.3 inch recipe. Awesome. Shape machines beautifully. It's so much fun. Like we talked about last week, you can make a real chip with it. It doesn't just turn to dust. Again, if I had to do this over, I would take uh, really just a few minutes, 20 minutes to build an enclosure and allow some cross air, you know, blowing in one, vacuuming out the other to really facilitate uh, better chip evacuation, but also health reasons. You don't want this stuff uh, to be breathed in and you don't want, there are dust particles out of this. You don't want those in your machine ways in the oil and in the gives.
After we finish the adaptive horizontal operation to clean up the top face, I use the same tool. A lot of times on a metal or aluminum, I would switch to a shorter tool for the rigidity, but here it wasn't a problem. Horizontal is one of the funniest tool paths to me. I'm sure somebody can comment in the comments below on why it does it, but it's the one tool path that it kind of is counterintuitive, where it goes to the middle and works its way out. It does do a constant uh, step over after it does that initial plunge in. I guess I wonder why doesn't it start from the outside and work its way in. The horizontal also takes care of cleaning up the inside floor. That's one reason why I kept the same tool in there as we had to get all the way down again to clean up that floor. Last but definitely not least, we're switching to a Lakeshore half inch ball end mill. And I'm doing a contour operation, which as you can see here, is walking up this inside wall, as well as handling the inside fillets. So the fillets are, I assume, more cosmetic and avoiding stress risers in the casting. The inside wall is important because that's what handles your taper. And I'm very new to this, but Fusion does have some pretty cool tools when it comes to inspect draft analysis. It can actually help you understand if you've got to create a, the correct draft when you pour a casting to be able to successfully remove it from the molar pattern. So before we remove the part, I want to add a spot drill in the center, which I can then use to drill a hole out. And I'm gonna use that to establish or double check my work coordinate system when I flip the part, because that's so important. And it's a little trickier to do that here now that we've got uh, two things. One, a tapered outside wall, but also we've got that hat top or mushroom cap that's getting in the way. So I've got my drilled hole. Let's flip it over and Here's the start of a mistake. I thought this would work, and here's the thing, it could have worked, but we had a problem. The part did pull up a little. What's frustrating is I didn't realize, but again, my thought on the work coordinate system is not just to rely on one point, like that center hole, but what I can also do is use a one, two, three block that becomes tangential with the bottom, which is the outermost edge of the flange. Same thing on the backside, using a uh, gauge block just to space the one, two, three block off a hair. And that tells me in this there is the bottom outside edge of that surface. That should be a pr pretty reliable reading. And then when we check that relative to the hole, gives me confidence that we've got the right coordinate system. And that's really, really important for me when you're working on a customer part, on material that's expensive or material that you only got one of. It's so tempting to want to delete this video and not share it as a Wednesday widget because it's so fun to share the successes in life and in, in, in machining and I love making stuff and I love being a good uh, example or a, oh, maybe even a role model for learning and here we goofed. But hopefully the takeaway from folks is to learn from our mistake. What's interesting is that this fixture and work holding worked pretty well when it came to the radial or twisting support, but the part I didn't think about is lifting up. You know, we added a stop on the right-hand side with a, a gauge pin. We swept it in. I sort of checked the rigidity. I knew how the wrench shape was cutting. It was relatively low tool forces, and we still, well, I was bummed. Lesson learned. We'll talk at the end about what we should have done or what you can do to do this similar work holding, but better and more reliable. Back to the cam. The way we have this part held right now, well, I wouldn't be able to take care of machining all around the taper edge, at least at the bottom portion. So we're splitting op two into 2A and 2B. And what we'll do is we'll switch our clamps between 2A and 2B without ever releasing the part. This actually is a way we probably should have done the motorcycle bracket that we just made, where with one fixture, you could move the inside clamp to the outside before you remove the first clamp, and thus you've switched your clamps without ever risking that the part moved. Adaptive strategy to get rid of most of the material. I did switch to a quarter inch tool with the thought that, again, you've got lower tool pressure, so less chance of pull out, even though we failed.
After done removing the bulk of the material with the adaptive strategy, we switch again to a horizontal. That's going to walk through and clean up all of my flat faces. Again, same quarter inch tool and a 2D contour to clean up these recessed planes, mainly the tighter uh, corners. One quick 2D contour with the longer tool to safely clean up this inside diameter here. Back to a quarter inch tool to clean up that bore. And then what I think is the fun stuff, the surfacing, half inch ball end mill. First we use the contour, 3D contour. And if you read the description, this is great for steep walls, not so great for shallow walls. So this handles most of what we need it to do. You can definitely see the part coming into shape and size, but to handle some of the last areas on the top, I wasn't happy with how it looked. So no big deal, same tool, but we switched to a 3D scallop to works with a constant offset. So we did a finer offset and contain that tool path with a height. So we said the lowest that toolpath can go is only 0.1 inches from the model top. And that means we've only got it doing work right around here. To move the clamps, I had Zach, our summer intern, make a wood insert that has a hole that lined up with our fixture plate. And what we were able to do is just use a standard strap clamp set and that lined up with the wood hole and that had quite a bit of hold down pressure. However, you really never want to use one clamp. So we added a second one with a washer. Now you gotta be really careful because you don't have a lot of strength to this wrench shape. In other words, you could easily crack it or cave it in or spread it out. And th that's one of the takeaways here of how do you do this better? I should have created a, an insert that fit the inside of this part. Uh, that would have allowed me to more reliably hold it and pinch it on the op 2A. And then on op 2B, it would have been able to give me more structural support, again, as I'm holding that down. The cam for 2B, roughing out the sidewalls with the same 3, three eighth inch end mill with just a 2D contour, walking down it in three steps just to get the bulk of it off. Now the problem with a ball end mill and the way this is being uh, held is that a ball end mill, if we go to simulate, I've got show points checked, put a click on one of these points. You can see that if I ran the ball end mill all the way down to the bottom, there's still gonna be this area that's not machined. So the first 3D contour we're doing is with the same 3 8 square shoulder tool. A bullnose tool would be preferable because it would reduce the amount of work you've got to do here, but really it's not a huge deal. So we're using that tool with a relatively fine step down to, to profile around the taper on the first section. Then we're switching to the same half inch ball end mill to do the rest of the 3D contouring. 75 thou step downs because it's a steep surface you get a relatively smooth outcome so again what are the takeaways better work holding i had had a pretty creative idea which i still think has potential of using great stuff or one of the expanding foam insulation materials to create this to quickly rather create this internal cavity which not only could it provide support, but we put a piece of wood in the middle of it when we poured the stuff, and that would have allowed me to use wood screws to screw from the top or the bottom and give me a really stable and structurally supported work holding. My mistake was I needed better plastic covering on the inside or some sort of a mold release so that it could have contoured the shape better, and then I needed more pressure on the top so that when the foam expanded, it expanded into the nooks and crannies better rather than it just expanding up the top. So again, and lesson learned, that was one way. The other way, again, take your time. Take the time to machine a wood or a plastic or aluminum insert that would have allowed us to do work holding from both the inside and outside. Again, take a look in the video description. We'll post a link to, I think there's both an Instagram and a practical machinist post on the fellow who's doing this South Bend restoration. We're happy to be a part of it. We talked to the customer. He was very happy. He's able to pretty easily fix our mistake with some Bondo. Uh, not proud of that, but nevertheless, part will work. Folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. See you next Wednesday.